Overfitting models to data can be a real pain to diagnose and to fix. Sometimes it's obvious. If your model's performing far better on the training set than the holdout set, then it's pretty clear you have a problem. But other times it can be more subtle. You might expect some degradation in performance between training and test, but how much is too much? And it's not enough to just know that you're overfitting. It's helpful to know which variables are causing the problem. This is where adversarial validation can help. It's a fancy sounding term, but it's really a pretty simple technique that allows you to not only get some measure of your overfitting, but also highlight which variables are responsible. It's used pretty extensively in Kaggle competitions to help identify these sources of overfitting, which are then corrected for additional performance gains. It's also an effective test of perhaps the most pervasive assumption in all of machine learning, which is that your data are independent and identically distributed, or IID. In this video, I want to explain the process of adversarial validation and then work through an example using credit card fraud data. Before I dig in, let me mention a few things. The first is that there's a blog post that accompanies this YouTube video where it works through the same example, but the code is laid out in line. So if you go to implement this, it might be a helpful resource. And I'll, of course, put the code on GitHub so that you can get that as well. The second thing is I'm announcing a Discord server that I just created and I'm hoping that people like you can join it and um, chat with the larger community and perhaps collaborate on things. I also have plans for having technical talks that are streamed and uh, talked about on that server. So if that sounds interesting to you, please join. Uh, and the third thing is that I have a mailing list and I announce content releases across a variety of platforms on that. So if you're interested, please subscribe to that. And the links to all of these things will be in the description. Adversarial validation is both conceptually simple and easy to implement. But before we get to implementation, let's build our intuition about it. Overfitting at a high level means that your model has learned relationships from the training data that don't generalize to new data. That could be because the model is fitting to the noise or memorizing parts of the training data set. But it could be for other reasons as well. Um, for instance, if your training and test data sets are from different time periods, maybe something changed. In the context of fraud detection, maybe the fraudsters are behaving differently. Or if you're making housing price predictions, maybe the market has fundamentally changed. If your input features capture a real difference between the training and test data sets, that implies these data sets came from different distributions. And therefore, the relative relationships between the input features are somehow different. In other words, if you could make a plot of all of your input features for both the training and test data sets, there could be regions where there's no overlap. Let's call this a plot of the feature space. The regions where there's training data but no test data represent things that the model might learn but wouldn't generalize to the test data set. And regions where there's test data but no training data are things that your model's never seen before and therefore might make unreliable predictions. Now that we have this background, let's talk about adversarial validation. Adversarial validation is when you learn a model to try to predict which samples came from the training set and which samples came from the test set. If these two data sets came from the same distribution and occupied the same parts of the feature space, then this should be impossible. But if there are systematic differences between the training and the test data set, then you're likely able to learn a model to distinguish among them. And the better model that you can build for making this determination, the bigger the violation you have of the assumption that your data is identically distributed. The implementation is simple, and to demonstrate it, I'm going to use the Kaggle dataset for credit card fraud detection. And that dataset has a predefined split between the training and test data, and it's important to note that the test data set occurred in a future time period relative to the training set. The only pre-processing I've done is fill in the missing values with a constant and I'm throwing in the transaction date as a feature so I wouldn't normally do that but the reason for doing it will become clear in just a minute so for now let's just assume that it was an accident and now we can run adversarial validation so the first thing we do is we throw away the target a fraud not fraud we won't need it for this case and we define a new target 
and we assign a value of zero to all the training records and a value of one to all the test samples. We then mix the training and test data sets into a big master data set. We shuffle it and then split into new training and test data sets, which we call adversarial train and adversarial test. As you might expect, we then train a model on the adversarial train data set to try to use the input features to predict which of these samples came from the original train and the original test data set. Here I'm using CatBoost, and then we can evaluate the model on the holdout adversarial test set, which again, the model tries to use the features to figure out which came from train and which came from test. So in other words, we treat it like any other classification task, but in this case, the target variable is a data set indicator that we've created. Here's an ROC curve of our model on the holdout set. You can see that we essentially have a perfect model with an AUC of one, which indicates that there's a significant difference between the training and test data sets with respect to the input features. The performance of this model is a measure of how big our problem is, where the better the model, the bigger the problem. But what can you do about it? As a next step, we can try to understand the adversarial validation model by looking at the feature importances. And in this case, the transaction date is by far the most important feature. So we know that that's important for the model to be able to tell the difference between the training and test samples. This makes sense because we know that the training and test samples are essentially defined by using a date to split them. And that's why this was included for the purposes of illustration because it um, demonstrates something important, which is that this adversarial validation technique is very effective at communicating that first, that your training and test sets are very different, and that's shown by the extremely high quality model that you get. But second, it can surface to you which variable is mostly responsible for this, in this case, the transaction date. Let's remove transaction date and rerun the process to see what we get. Now we see the ROC AUC decreased from 1 to 0 0.917. So this is still a pretty strong model, but also a substantial decrease in performance. And now the top feature is ID31. And if you look at the values of ID31, you'll see that it has particular software versions in it. And it doesn't take too much thought to realize this is sort of like including a raw date because you won't observe particular versions of software until after its release date. As a next step, let's remove the version information from this column so that just the device platform remains. So for instance, Firefox 61.0 just becomes Firefox. And when we rerun adversarial validation, we see that the performance does drop from 0.917 down to 0.906. Well, this is just part of the story because that change could have also hurt your modeling performance on the task you actually care about, which is fraud detection. So you need to use creativity and iteration to balance this trade-off and find interesting ways to represent your features such that the predictive value of them is maintained, but you also maintain consistency between your training and test data sets. In sum, adversarial validation has shown a light on a problem and its cause, but it doesn't offer us a solution. For that, we still need to use our creativity and expertise. So in this case, with software versions, we just threw away the version information, but maybe a better approach would have been finding the software release dates for all of those um, software versions and calculated a feature like days since release, and that would have maintained some sort of information about the recency, um, but also been generic across the training and test data sets. But whether that additional effort is justified or not will depend, of course, on the specific problem. If you were to look at the winning solution to this Kaggle competition on credit card fraud detection, you would see that their entire approach relied on using adversarial validation to identify collections of variables that led to this type of overfitting. And then they then came up with these aggregations that minimized this problem. And they used adversarial validation as a diagnostic to make sure that they were moving the needle in the right direction and, and leading to less overfitting. And then of course they would evaluate um, the fraud prediction task to make sure that they weren't harming that. So the trick is coming up with the feature transformation or, or whatever you're going to do that solves both the problems simultaneously. If you've never tried adversarial validation, I encourage you to give it a shot because it can be really insightful and spur a whole new line of creative thought for feature engineering. So I hope this helps and I'll see you next time.